Good evening. I'd like to call the December 9th, 2019 special meeting to order for the York County School Board. Unfortunately, Mr. Richardson, as you can see, is not with us. He's out sick and Mr. Medford has a commitment out of town. So this is who you have. Here we are. We have our quorum. Thanks for coming, folks. Um, I'd like to welcome Candy Skinner to the table in her new official role. Chief Academic Officer. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And we certainly also hope that Dr. Guy is enjoying her first week of retirement. I suspect <laughs> she probably is. <clears throat> so anyway, let's get right into our presentations. We have several topics on our agenda this evening, so we'll get started with our uh, presentations. Dr. Shander, would you please share the comments on the first strategic plan update? Yes, thank you, Dr. George. Good evening, board members. Dr. Amanda Corbin, State and Associate Director for Human Resources, will present an update on components of goal three of the YCSD strategic plan. I'll turn it over to Dr. Corbin State. Thank you, Dr. Shandor, Dr. George, and members of the board. Tonight, I will be sharing a strategic plan update of, on components of our goal three as we recruit, hire, support, and retain a diverse staff that meets our highest standards. I will be addressing goal three, objective two of the York County School Division strategic plan, which states, the division will implement data-driven strategies to recruit and retain a diverse workforce. As you are aware, our nation continues to grapple with the impact of the teacher shortage, which forecasts an estimated supply and demand gap of 100,000 teachers per year until at least 2021. Virginia is not immune to this dynamic. Recent research cited by the Governor's Advisory Committee on Virginia Teacher Shortages states that the number of unfilled teacher positions across the state has increased by 40% in the last 10 years. Essentially, there is a vacancy in one out of every 100 classrooms in Virginia. Now we will examine this metric in YCSD. As you will see, over the past three years, our classroom teacher vacancies at the start of school have decreased by half largely in part to their early special education teacher hiring. Enrollment projections and staffing numbers have been accurate. However, late resignations after July 1 have been a barrier to fully staffing our schools. We will now turn our attention to our recruitment efforts as our goal is to ensure that all classrooms are staffed on day one. Since FY18, 57.5% of our new hires have come from our surrounding districts, and 21.5% have come from Virginia College programs. The remainder have come from the hiring sources listed. As the majority of our new hires come from surrounding districts and Virginia College programs, it is imperative that we remain present and competitive on the job fair and job fair venue and recruiting circuit. We have recently held three non-licensed job fairs focused on recruiting <coughs> substitute employees, paraeducators, bus drivers, and custodians. For our most recent summer non-licensed job fairs, 91 people attended and 47 were given offers right on the spot, including substitutes, one teacher, and one custodian. Related to hiring bus drivers, Dr. Carroll provided an update at the November meeting about all of the strategies being explored to hire bus drivers in the face of the <coughs> national bus driver shortage that continues. In partnership with our hiring managers, we will continue to strategically expand our recruitment efforts for hiring of our specialized skilled trade bus driver and other non-licensed positions. As a result of our hiring trend analysis, we will host a YCSD job jamboree on March 21st, and this all position hiring event will showcase in a high energy way why YCSD is a great place to work and learn. We will review hiring patterns in Virginia Department of Education identified critical shortage areas and consider extending early teaching offers to elementary, math, and CTE teacher candidates as we did for special education teachers last year. We are also gearing up for our annual recruiting trips to college and university education job fairs across Virginia and other states by continuing to match our staff to recruit at their alma maters 
to build strong connections with teacher graduates. Now, as we know, once we recruit teachers and other staff to YCSD, our charge as an organization is to retain them. Taking a bottom line approach to retention, these calculations exclude the total number of employees who separated from YCSD for any reason. As you will see on the slide, our overall retention percentages for licensed and non-licensed employees have increased by approximately two percentage points. We are focusing our efforts on retaining our workforce as we know that consistency has great benefits for students and for the health of our organization. These strategies will be discussed a little bit later in this update. Let's take a closer look at the top three reasons employees in each category indicate for their separation from YCSD. As you saw in the previous slide, on average, just over 9% of employees have separated from YCSD in recent years. This slide lists the top three reasons of separation for licensed staff and non-licensed staff. Further analysis of this data reveals that recruitment remains the number one reason for employee separation from YCSD with around one third of licensed and just under a quarter of non-licensed employees retiring over the past two years. Over the same time period, the next two reasons on the slide for licensed and non-licensed employee separations account for almost 65% of separations. Now, we will look at our focused next steps in employee retention. As Dr. Vladu shared in our October meeting, our division is <coughs> on the leading edge of the state working conditions, survey, and administration, and data analysis as we respond to ensure that YCSD remains a great place to work and learn for our employees. When people are looking to change school divisions, we realize that compensation is a factor that they consider. And a presentation on compensation will be presented at the January work session. Also, we recognize that as compared to our region, YCSD strives to maintain competitive and fair benefits a significant factor of consideration for employees who enroll in our benefits package. We will now transition to a review of staff and student diversity metrics. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 requires that all public school divisions in our nation file the federal EEO-5 report biennially. As evidenced by our strategic plan's focus on diversity and inclusivity, in non-reporting years, we've committed to continuing to report EEO-5 data updates to our board. We will now turn our attention to a review of diversity in our division's workforce as compared to student diversity. <coughs> on this slide, we see that the overall percentage of minority students has increased slightly in FY19, while the percentage of black African American students remained relatively steady. We will now look at demographics related to the diversity makeup of our staff, and we will start with new hires. While new hire numbers do not yet closely match our student diversity population, we do see a maintained rise from 2019, 2014, excuse me, in the 2019 totals of the total minority new hire classroom teachers, as well as the black African American percentage. Now we will review data on classroom teacher diversity. Could you go back and look um, 2019 and see again the difference <clears throat> The numbers there for 2019. <coughs> in 20 non reporting year? Yes, ma'am. The EEO 5 mm -hmm. re requires mm -hmm. that we report biennially. Okay. So in non reporting years, which this will be our first non reporting year to the board, so that's why the 2019 numbers have the asterisk, but that's also why it seems to be a bit off. Okay. It's 2014, 16, 18, and then 19. Because it seems like we made a drop. If just looking at that without <clears throat> slightly in, in black African American percentages, yes, Ms. Haywood, slightly. Okay. okay, I'm ready to click. Oops. 
There we go. As related to total classroom teacher status, we acknowledge that there is work to do to close the gap between teacher and student minority and black African American representation. We recognize that we are holding relatively steady with the modest gains made since 2014, but are eager to see this gap begin to close even more. It is important to YCSD to continue to work at having a teaching force that better mirrors our students. As Dr. Carroll shared last year, in 2018, the reporting categories were refined, resulting in a new baseline year. Therefore, the difference you see on the slide is from 2018. On this slide, the numbers in blue indicate where our workforce percentages exceed their corresponding student population. You will notice that while the overall minority percentages for APs <coughs> declined significantly, the overall minority percentages for principals increased significantly. This positive increase is a direct result of Dr. Shandor's focus on how we as an organization develop leadership from our healthy pipeline of instructional coordinators, assistant principals, and teacher leaders. Now we will identify some next steps as we continue our work focused on recruiting a diverse teaching workforce. Our efforts include a focus on historically black colleges and universities as we seek to develop new and strengthen existing relationships with their undergraduate programs. Division staff are also researching the feasibility of implementing an internal teaching pipeline to grow our own educators. Programs of this nature are increasing nationwide to address the teacher shortage, and programs like these are shown to be a strategy to increase diversity in schools. As the Learning Policy Institute states, teachers generally prefer to teach near where they grew up and attended high school. Grow your own programs provide exposure to a career in education and resources to support to resources, excuse me, and support to motivate students along the way to the pathway of the profession. Lastly, we will maintain our practices of sharing data with our principals about their minority employee rates in relation to the division average <clears throat> and continuing principal and assistant principal professional development about reducing implicit bias in the hiring process. We recognize the interconnectedness among recruitment, retention, and diversity, and we are excited about the development and implementation of these strategic efforts. Our goals are for our students to have a teaching force that better reflects their diverse makeup and to maintain our work to positively address working conditions so that our staff will continue to extol that York County School Division is a great place to work and learn. Thank you for this opportunity. This concludes my update, and I welcome any questions you may have at this time. Fantastic presentation. You were upset for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Brett, Barbara, any questions? Um, of the <coughs> 47 who are offered contracts, y'all probably some except workforce. For the non-licensed employees, we were very, very close, all but four of them for reasons whether they got a different job okay. or relocated did not. But we had a very, very positive turnover. And many of them, Mrs. Haywood, who started as substitutes, are now paraeducators in our classroom. So we're very excited about that. Two, two work sessions, a work session ago, we talked about the data of students doing well in the classroom and the achievement gap. We're, we're narrowing the gap. We still have work to do. Do you see a relationship between the diversity of your teacher pool and the diversity of your students and students doing well and not doing well? 
Does that question make sense? It yeah. does. It does make sense. And I would have to say, Mrs. Haywood, from my limited time back in your county, I would not be advised to make a comment on that as have not having studied that data. Okay. But just in my career as an educator and the research that I have done, we definitely know when students feel cared about, first and foremost, mm -hmm. when that teacher builds a relationship with them, that that is when they really, really feel safe enough to take risks and learn new things. But we are all mindful of the necessary um, requirement for students to see folks who look like them yeah, when they go exactly. in their classrooms exactly. so they know that you know it's possible for them so we're, we're continuing that work it is our goal it is near and dear to all of our hearts and we will not stop until we get closer and closing that gap and the handout we have that's school by school yes ma'am and we can take a look at that okay. yes thank you Dr. Corbin Satan, thank you. This is this is a, an excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Great, George. great information. Thank you so thank much, you. and we wish you all the very best. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corbin Satan. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Thank you. We're going to move into some uh, budget-related items here, and Dr. Shandor, if you'll go ahead and introduce that next agenda item. Yes, thank you, Dr. George. Our first um, discussion related to the budget is the FY 2021. <coughs> Budget Outlook, Mr. Bill Bone, our Chief Financial Officer, is going to provide an update related to end-of-year balances, talk about proposed changes to the FY20 budget, and some preliminary information around the FY21 budget. Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Um, Dr. George, members of the, of the board, um, just have a brief update tonight on the budget. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns, but I wanted to start with how we ended FY19, and we did end the year uh, on another <coughs> strong note. Our operating fund balance for general funds was $917,000. And if you recall, at the November business meeting, we uh, the, the board approved a motion requesting that that $917,000 be reappropriated back to the school division uh, for uses in the capital and for technology. So that request has been sent over to the county, and we're waiting to hear when that will land on their agenda. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about last year and, and you know this, um, is, is impact aid. We have a baseline budget of $8.5 million for impact aid, so any, any revenue, impact aid revenue that we receive above that benchmark uh, goes, goes back to the county, it reverts to the county, and then it's deposited into the Revenue Stabilization Fund. Uh, please report that last year we collected uh, approximately $10.9 million, so $2.4 million Went back to uh, went back to the revenue stabilization fund. So that's to be used for future use. And on, under agreements between the board, uh, school board, and the board of supervisors, whenever we need those funds, we just have to request. And I'll talk a little bit more about the impact date or the revenue stabilization funds in the CIP presentation. Looking forward to FY21. At this point, um, there's a couple things we're waiting for. The governor's release set to release his budget on December 17th, so we'll have more about the details and what the impacts of the governor's proposals and priorities will mean for us um, at that time. I'll have a formal presentation at the January work session on, on the governor's priorities. Um, the, a couple things that we do know about the state um, budget moving forward is uh, the state has a biennial budget process, and this is the first year of the biennial, pro biennial budget. And um, leading up to that process, there are a couple things that happen. One is the local composite index is updated, VRS rates are updated, and also the rebenchmarking process occurs. And all those things, the three things happen in the fall, and we learn a little bit about what, what impact it might have on our budget prior to the governor's release. So what we know at this point is the local composite index uh, has decreased for York County by a tenth of, per, of a percent. Uh, that's not significant. It's heading in the right direction because as the rate goes down, it means that the state pays more for the cost of education and the locality pays less or is required to pay less. Um, what we're, the, the last time we saw that adjustment, it, two years ago, it was about 0.83% and it was about $400,000 to $450,000 um, of, of an impact to us. So we saw additional money from the state as a result of that. Being that it's only a tenth of a percent, we don't see that it's going to be a significant change for us. The VRS Board of Trustees has approved um, VRS rates for our employees for the next two years. They have, uh, they're proposing that those rates increase 0.93% percentage points. Uh, these are just proposed rates, so the governor and, and or the General Assembly can adopt different rates. Um, so we're waiting to see if the governor is, is making a recommendation to adopt something uh, different than what the Board of Trustees has has approved. If those rates hold, we're looking at approximately $450,000 would be the impact to 
uh, to our budget. So we'd have to find another 450,000 to make up that loss. So we'll uh, hopefully we'll at least see the rates stay the same. Um, if not, then something less than the 0.93%. And the other thing is the rebenchmarking process. And this is a process where the, the state recalculates the cost of education. So they look at data four years ago and they look at things like how salaries changed, how benefits changed, how materials and supplies, how transportation, all these different categories. And, um, and then they adjust uh, based on an inflation factor. Uh, what we normally see at this point is the total dollar. So we're looking at about a half a billion dollars over, over the two years. Uh, but we don't always necessarily see that half a billion dollars come to us. Uh, the, the General Assembly and or the governor can, can adopt the full half a billion dollars and, and put that money back into K-12, or they can do something less. So again, until we see the, the final General Assembly budget, we won't know what that rebenchmarking process um, that impact has on our budget. So that's kind of the update we have on, on on the budget outlook. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm just I'm just curious. You know, if the, if the local composite index. How has it trended the last, say, three cycles, the last six years? Has it has it been up and down and up then down, or has it been more? Has it been trending down? I don't this is recall. this is the third cycle where we've seen it trend down. Okay, uh, but this is the smallest. Um, decrease that we've seen of those of those three cycles. So um, I wonder how Northern Virginia fared this time. Do you know? Well, as as Northern Virginia economy um, grows, and yeah. usually that's the benefit to most other localities right. around the state. Um, but your county is a is a wealthy considered a wealthy community. So uh, while we did see a decrease, we just didn't see the decrease that we've seen in the past two cycles. Yeah. It used to be we were sort of the Polar opposite of, uh, of uh, Northern Virginia. I mean, it right. was big swings one way or the other for. for and they dictate Northern Virginia pretty much dictated. Yeah, oh, the rest did, of the yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well. The good news also is the economy in Virginia is very very strong, and as the economy goes, so does K twelve funding. Um, we do know that K twelve is a priority of this governor, mm -hmm. so we're we're excited to hear that. Um, but we just have to wait and see what his priorities. Are we able, you just made a comment about the state, are we able to identify the amount of funds your cash received from the lottery? Do we have any any ballpark idea? We, we do. They, they give us that funding in, in categories. So okay. we see what the general funds are, and then they have separate with programs that are funded by the lottery. One of the big changes they did two years ago was they're giving us a nice chunk of the lottery dollars. It's probably about... $2.7 million as a supplemental per pupil allocation, which means it's not tied to textbooks or it's not tied to a specific program. It's money that comes to us that we can right. prioritize how that money's spent. Typically what happens in a recession, um, they'll move things like remedial summer school and they'll move textbook funding mm -hmm. to the lottery dollars. It's just a shifting of funds and so where we see right now, we're, we have the discretion to use those dollars. Um, and we'll, when we get to the next recession, we'll see less discretion and more of SOQ, typically SOQ funded items coming out of the lottery. It was dollars. just interesting because the news is talking about as more of the gaming is coming into the cities, the money that's usually through the lottery will decrease so that if you were putting all the lottery money towards schools, You'll see a decrease in that. I was just curious yes. how that would play out for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. And I believe you're going to continue with capital improvements for us. Would you like to introduce that? Yeah. Um, so this is a follow-up to the facilities master plan presentation from last month from Dr. Carroll, Mr. Shearhart. Um, Mr. Bowen will now present our uh, CIP to the board. He also is going to highlight um, some of the um, modifications that were made. Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Dr. Shandor and Dr. George and members of the board. So this evening, I'm going to present the superintendent's proposed capital improvements program for fiscal years 2021 through 2026. And a copy of the CIP has been provided to you. The basis of the CIP is the six-year facilities master plan that was presented in detail by Dr. Carroll and Mr. Shearhart at the November 11th work session. I won't review the individual projects. Uh, what I will do is I'll talk about those projects that have been redlining because those are those are indications that changes have been made since the uh, FMP was presented to you in November. So let me begin with the DARE project, DARE S Elementary SBO. This is to create a bus loop and, and additional parking spaces. 
This, uh, this project with DARE was not on the CIP last year. This was added to the FMP because of um, challenges that we're seeing in capacity. One of the things that we've looked at is we've looked at available space at our schools, and we have a couple of schools in the lower part of the county that we can expand, and DARE is one of those. So we're looking at expansion um, at DARE Elementary. So the bus loop and additional parking was already on the CIP. However, what we want to do is whenever you're doing parking, resurfacing, or creating new parking, and it's combined with a uh, expansion or, or renovation, mm -hmm. you want to do the parking lot at the end because usually mm -hmm. there's a lot of heavy equipment and they tend to tear up the parking. So that's why we shifted that project out. Uh, here, Waller Mill Elementary, we have moved Waller Mill up from 25, 26 to fiscal years 24 and 25. And again, this reflects uh, our needs and, and what we've seen uh, with, the, with the development in the northern part of the county. And this is also in line with our strategy. First, we, we, we go to learning cottages. And then after that, we look at expansion. And then after that, we look at new schools. And I'll talk a little bit about the new elementary school because this, this change also impacts the new element, the proposed new elementary school. Queens Lake Middle. Now, these next three projects are all aligned together. Um, again, the, we've moved Queens Lake Middle School here. We've moved that out from 22, 23, and 24 to 23 to 25. And again, this reflects information that we that we feel we have. Is it? It just there, there's there's not as much capacity issue um, at in the northern part of the county, particularly with Queens Lake at this time. So we think we can afford to to move that out one year. And this is also a balancing act of balancing our our needs and also balancing the funding dollars from the county. So again, we had the expanding of the bus loop. We moved that out to match the end of that expansion project at Queens Lake. And then we get to the locker rooms. Um, initially, this was a locker room project at Queens Lake that was grouped with several other locker rooms um, at, our, at our middle and high schools. Um, what we've done is Mr. Shearhart took one of our A&E contractors uh, around to our schools to look at those uh, locker rooms and restrooms. And they were concerned about the dollars that we had budgeted for those projects. There are some projects that actually are in greater need and pro will probably require some, some more dollars than what we have on the, on the CIP at this time. So if you recall, in early June, the board approved the commissioning of a facility study. And we are almost at the final stages of signing that contract. We're just waiting for the, the vendor to submit their, their bonds. Their bid bonds and then after that point we will begin that facility study and the CIP committee and senior management felt like this was the appropriate thing to do was to hold off on those projects until the facility study is complete and that way we can we can have more accurate information as far as the cost for those projects. Can I ask a quick question yes, regarding that? I understand the rationale for putting it out and understand the parking lot to go with the end of the construction and so forth and so on. With respect to locker rooms and just repair, how long does it take to get a work order in? Suppose you have, I know the kids were saying sometimes the, the door is off the stall or just their problems. With old yes. buildings, how long does it take to, for a principal to say, we need this repaired? I'm going to let Dr. Carroll answer that question. Yeah, that's a separate issue. Maintenance uh, <clears throat> department handles any repairs. Anything that's security related or safety is first, and then other types of uh, projects like that. But um, Mr. Dolak, would you like to give a more specific answer as to? Um, I think to reiterate what you said, Dr. Carroll, it does uh, depend on the severity of the issue and actually to the schools putting the work order in. Um, as far as, you know, <clears throat> bathroom doors and security issues, those are taking a pretty high um, seriousness rate, so we'll get on those right away. And sometimes it depends on, too, with, as you said, the older systems, it's coming up with a way to make the repair, an interim repair, if we know we have something coming up that's feasible without having to redesign or repurchase all the systems. That's always, you think about something like that when you have an older building, mm -hmm. and you keep pushing something back even farther <clears throat> out then when do you make it appealing to even go use it, so to speak, so, okay. 
The next projects, again, uh, Tab Middle and Yorktown Middle locker rooms. Again, those have been pushed out awaiting the completion of the facility study. Uh, we have Bruton renovate locker rooms, and we also have renovate restrooms on the SOA and the cafeteria. Again, those have been pushed out for the facility study, and also the Tab High locker rooms and restrooms. And then we have uh, the York High project, replace and coat the low slope roof. This is a two-year project that will commence this summer. The change here in FY21, the second year, is that we just went out to bid with that project and we just received the bids back and the, the bids actually came in much less than what we had budgeted. It's about $545,000 less. So we, uh, we are reducing that project appropriately and we've actually shifted that funding down to the York High Annex. Uh, this was a project that was on the capital improvements program or plan last year and throughout this this year in the development of the new plan, we actually pulled that project off just because of other priorities. We have, we're addressing the needs of, of capacity and growth, so we pulled that project off. We feel like we've got a really good plan to address the, the capacity issues, so we've added this project back for the York High Annex, and that's a, that's a building, it's a shared facility with the county and the school division uh, beside York High School. The county uses it for their studio, they have some camera people in there now. They're getting ready to move those people out and, and, and shift some IT people in. And we use it as our lifelong learning center. So we have a nice computer lab set up there that we do a lot of training when it requires a, a nice computer lab for that. And then the York High locker rooms, we, again, we shifted those out, um, again, waiting for the facility study. The division-wide project, and this is the replacement of division-wide communication system, our 800 megahertz radios. We have a number of these radios, as you can imagine, throughout the division for, for security reasons. The, the county uh, coordinates those, those radios for us. Uh, we, we pay for them, but they tell us when it's time to have them replaced, and so they've, they've told us that. The change here is, um, is we're changing the funding source. We had it initially set as debt service. However, because we do have such a large balance in our revenue stabilization fund, we felt it was appropriate to use those dollars and, and not tax the, the debt service of the county to purchase those radios. So uh, that's the change there. And in the video services, this is a, a project that once it started, it was, again, this is a shared service between county and, and school division. This was placed on the CIP. This is really operational dollars. And so we're removing it from the CIP. And we're just going to add it to our, our operating budget. We've been paying for this out of our operating budget. However, we've been paying for it out of end of year dollars. So we'll work to make this a more permanent um, part of our operating budget moving forward. And then the new elementary school, which I, I mentioned earlier, um, we, we shifted the A&E and the new elementary school out a year. And again, this is in line with what we believe are our, our priorities and our strategy and consistent with our strategy to, to expand before we build a, a new school. Um, the, cost, the cost of the Waller Mill expansion is about a third of the cost of, of a new school, and this is at today's dollars. So um, we imagine when we get to 25 and 26, this, this is going to be a higher price tag. But um, certainly we felt like this was more in line um, with with our strategy. Also, if you'll note that the new elementary school, we, we removed the name Marquee from that. Uh, we, we did that because we wanted to give ourselves um, options. We wanted to leave our options open. Basically, just if other property comes available, we didn't want to tie ourselves to specifically to that property. Now, we had an agreement um, that we had to have conceptual drawings. We've, we've, ob we've met that obligation. However, the, tr the property has not transferred to the county or to the school division, so it still sits in the developer's name. So we haven't taken that next leap, but um, certainly we wanted to keep our options open as the county continues to develop the northern part of the, northern part of the county. That We believe that there could be possibly some other options for us down the road. Right, or we may need it in the south part of the county. Correct. Correct. And that's the superintendent's pres uh, proposed CIP. Now, I, that's something I didn't mention and I should have pointed out. The FY20E, we're not talking really about that. Those, those dollars have already been appropriated. Um, what we're looking at is FY21 through 26, but what the county is going to fund us on is that first year FY21. So those dollars, if approved by the school board and there's no changes, this will be approved or taken up for consideration in May by the county. And if approved um, as presented, 
um, by, if it's approved by the county, then those dollars will become available July 1 of 2020. Good question. And I think, Dr. Shander, your last comment was looking at the new school, whether it's the, the site in the upper county or you mentioned or at the lower county if needed. I go back to the time when the board bought the Grafton property. You know, we looked for a piece of property that would be available to build a school and all the sports fields and everything. And we found that piece, but we sat on it for a long time because we didn't have the full student population, but we knew it was coming. So I think even, even some of the citizens at that point talked about why are you holding on to this property, get rid of it, and we didn't. I think about the northern end, and I think about the properties that were available then when the Marquise was, was selected. Mm -hmm. As we <clears throat> go forward with the northern end, my, my question is, if you find a piece of property, knowing with, with the Colonial Parkway and all the government property up there, if you find, the county finds a piece of property that's suitable acreage for a school, do you think the county is willing to buy it and we sit on it until, we know the population is going to increase there. I just don't want to lose the opportunity to have a piece of property in the northern end in District 1. If we don't build on it, we hold it until the growth comes versus now we're moving everybody south. And you know, that's all. That's all I, I would say. Give consideration to buying a piece wherever it is in District 1. Yeah, I think we're certainly going to do that. We've had numerous conversations with the county. Mm -hmm. I think a concern for our team is as the as the south schools are, mm -hmm. um, as we went through the capacity at the, la the through the FMP process, we have a number of schools that are at or above capacity, and that's increasing in the south. Then up north, you, we still have that development moving. Not, yeah, and so when it we sort of, up, right? We sort of have both things going at the same time. So I think that ongoing open communication with Mr. Morgan and his team, which we just met with a week ago, um, that's certainly something that we're looking at. I think the, the idea between uh, taking Marquis off of there is to give ourselves And I'm fine with that. For, I'm, I'm okay right. with that. The other piece, and I can remember lower end of the county, um, when we were booming so quickly, you changed the attendance zone to one school, then the next year or so you shifted it back, and trying to move kids back and forth. Even to say you move them from Magruder to Walla Mill only to move them back mm -hmm. again. And, and you don't want that to happen. So that's the, the overall thought is, do you have a, will the county find a piece of property that you can sit a school comfortably on? And even if the growth is not there to fill a school, it's coming. Mm -hmm. So don't want to lose the opportunity to have a suitable space. Yeah, so we agree with you and that's, yeah. that's the okay. plan. Thanks, Mr. Shearer, our question. I don't think he's here. He's not oh, here. I guess I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not there. I, I'm curious. Maybe you, you'll know. Maybe. Dr. Carroll may know. Yeah, maybe so. I'm, I think we talked about it at the last work session. The, the increase, the percentage increase annually uh, to build this school, was there some sort of a numerical value we had for that? Yes, what we've been working with as we move things across is a 5% uh, markup for inflation each year. Per year. So in, in some projects that's worked out well, and others it's been short. So in reality, it's costing us five percent more to build that each year. Is that correct? That's the is assumption that, we're making. Because <clears throat> I remember when we first started talking about this school. I mean, it was a much lower price tag, but that was oh, yeah. way back, yeah. way back. So it's a lot to juggle. I mean, it they're, is. They're it's a tough an awful lot to juggle. And one thing I'll add is, um, five years ago when I first came here, I remember when Magruder and Yorktown mm -hmm. Elementary School were really, really uh, packed, and there was a lot of questions around that. Mr. Morgan and I went and walked a number of different properties, and quite honestly, where we settled was the marquee because it right. was the best, best of what of we the had three to look at. Yeah, exactly. So, however, with, with saying that, you know, there may be some other opportunities um, up in the north as well for and us. And that's wonderful. My whole piece is if you're booming down here mm -hmm. and you're looking for a piece of property on the lower end, 
and we don't take advantage of a piece of property in the northern end when it becomes available and we just hold on to it. Mm -hmm. We've done that in the past. Absolutely. Buy it and hold on to it yeah. because the growth is coming. You see that. I think there will yeah. be plenty of eyes looking for yeah. sure. Yeah. No okay. And Dr. Schoenifer, I can point out one more thing here. Um, from, the, from the presentation at the FMP uh, in November, uh, there were some changes to to the total, we went from 117 million um, six to um, eight to 117 million six. So we went down two hundred thousand dollars. But the real change was here between what's uh, being will, will be funded by debt service and what will be funded by cash. So for debt service under the FMP, we were at 115 and a half million. We've gone down to 113 and a half million. So we're um, about two million dollars less in debt service. And then when we use more, our, our, our strategy is to use more of the revenue stabilization dollars or end of year money. Um, and that, that helps us both out. It helps the county out. If, we, if we're able to use some of our end of year dollars for capital, then it certainly helps the county in not having to borrow those dollars. Right. And then hopefully those dollars that they save can come to us as operational dollars. So there's a bit of strategy um, in, in that, in that um, funding mechanism. All right. All right. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Bowen. That's great, great information. Appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I believe we have another update on our strategic plan. We do. Thank you, Dr. George. I'm going to ask Dr. Karen Cagle if she'll come on up to the table. Associate Director of Educational Technology and Innovation. She's going to provide an update on four objectives under goal two of our strategic plan. I'll turn it over to Dr. Cagle. Ms. Skinner can get the mouse working. <laughs> It is a tiny mouse. <laughs> I apologize. That's fine. Well, good evening, Ms. Um, the board members and Dr. Shandor. Last year, I shared information on the work of your county school division, teachers and administrators, that addressed several of our strategic plan objectives related to career readiness. <coughs> well, tonight I'm excited to provide an update on these objectives, which will include highlights from our work today and our next steps. Here you see our broadest objective that relates to career readiness. It's our commitment to providing career awareness and exploration opportunities to students at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school. I'll also give updates tonight on the number of clubs we have at the elementary and middle school levels that increase exposure and interest to high demand career fields, um, such as STEM and technology. I'm also going to share with you how we're measuring um, student demonstration of workplace readiness skills at the middle and high school levels. And then I'm going to share with you the progress of our students completing work-related experiences such as internships and mentorships. So last year I shared this graphic which shows th that our work starts in elementary school. As soon as those kids arrive to school, we're working on career readiness and we introduce them to a variety of career um, uh, careers that are out there in many different ways. And then when they get to middle school, they take it a step further and start doing more targeted investigation on things that they're passionate about or that they're interested in. And then in high school, that's when we want them to implement their plans by selecting courses that align with the careers that they might be interested in. So let's look at these in more detail, beginning with how we're using the Virginia Education Wizard. So this is a resource, and this graphic kind of shows you how we're using it. It's a resource that we use at the elementary level to introduce kids to careers. It's just one of many resources, but it's a plethora of online res um, lessons and um, ideas that teachers can use to share um, careers with students. And in fifth grade, our students develop portfolios, academic and career portfolios, based on their interests that they carry with them for the remainder of their school experience that they can add to and update. And then when they get to middle school, they start taking career inventories and skills assessments, and they um, complete an um, academic and career plan in middle school. And this drives the course selection through high school. And I'm really excited that um, over the summer, our school counselors met at the beginning of the school year to revise that academic and career plan so that it has a stronger career planning focus to it. Um, we had kind of focused on the academic piece. Now we've got that career planning piece really built in there as well. And the new document also helps support the transition from middle school to high school. So I'm really excited about that. 
So what you see on this slide is our progress towards um, our objective to increase the number of high demand career clubs in our elementary and middle schools. And you may remember that in FY18, you provided some funding to support these clubs. And so we started seeing an increase. And we've seen an increase in elementary and overall. Slight decrease this year with our middle schools. But keep in mind that these are beginning of the year club numbers and that clubs are added throughout the school year based on student interest, teacher interest in supporting those clubs. And so I'm really pleased to share with you that our administrators report that approximately a thousand of our students in elementary and middle schools are participating in these clubs. So what you see on this slide is just a list of some of the clubs that we offer at different elementary and middle schools. Um, these are our high demand career clubs and they really focus on critical thinking, creativity, collaboration. Those skills are very necessary in the world of work. And so we also have some of our clubs like the Great Computer Challenge and the First Lego League that um, are team clubs, they're competition clubs. So I think that the top picture on the left side shows some of our, um, one of our teams participating in the First Lego League competition. And three of our four um, First Lego League clubs went on to state um, this past weekend. And so they're doing a great job with the competition clubs. And they, um, so, so we wanna encourage those in the school division. I'm really excited about our maker spaces. And I shared with you last year that through the um, DODEA STEM grant that we have, it's a million dollar grant that we have with the Department of Defense, that, this, that we are putting maker spaces in our elementary and middle schools. And so you see here the year one schools that have, um, we've already put the maker spaces in this year and we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm by staff and students as students, um, engage in problem solving and uh, perseverance and process thinking in these spaces. Um, we provided some resources for our schools, some like VR goggles with all schools should have, 3D printers, those types of things. And then our schools also <coughs> specified items that they wanted in their makerspace based on their school's preference and individual needs. But, it, but I, I love to see the kids just and we, I actually have some pictures of Dr. Shandor and, and some of our um, other um, school board personnel participating in these maker spaces too, but I, I didn't share those with you on here. But we're having a good time with those. In addition to the maker space, the grant also um, funded our summer academy, and which is really um, targeted for military connected students in fourth and seventh grade. They participate with robotics, engineering, those types of things, hands-on activities. We have community partner involvement that I'm really excited about to get the kids um, interested and engaged in STEM. This is also funded by our grant. The grant has also provided funds for teacher and leadership training to support STEM instruction. Elementary and middle school teachers received training and resources in August. And for those interested, we have learning that's been extended to master classes where they can continue learning and growing in this area. Uh, furthermore, each middle school sent two educators to the Virginia Military Institute STEM conference back in September. So what does this look like in the classroom? Well, teachers were provided lessons and they were also provided a lot of resources to take back to the classroom, which they were able to turn around and implement. Um, some of our grade levels are still waiting to implement them based on where the, it falls in the curriculum. But here you see some examples of, of how it's already taking place in the classroom. And so um, each lesson included a book and then a tie to a STEM <coughs> career. And one of my favorites is second grade where the students engaged in the engineering design process. Um, they read the book, Sasha, The Three-Legged Wonder, which is a book written by one of our teachers, a uh, third grade teacher at Dare Elementary. And the students read the book, and then they designed a prosthetic leg for a dog. Is that not too cool? That's nice. That's cool. Yeah. 
So then let's look at middle school. This year we started the middle school career investigations um, course. This course includes instruction to help bridge the academic and career exploration in elementary school with the career planning that takes place in high school. In addition, students learn about workplace readiness skills. You see the um, student at the bottom there shaking the hand of the person interviewing them and um, this meets our strategic this course meets our strategic plan objective to measure workplace readiness skills for middle school students and at the high school to measure the workplace readiness skills for high school students is through our work related experiences and um, if you remember last December I shared our strategic plan objective stating that by FY22 our seniors will have completed a work related experience. Well this is a pretty lofty goal and I want you to keep in mind that it's a lofty goal for all of our seniors to do that but it's a very important goal because it helps them develop workplace um, readiness skills that are, you know, those skills that are essential in the workplace, but it helps them discover what careers they might or might not want to do. So keep that in mind. So as you can see from our data, we have not made progress like we would like to have with this, this objective. Although we have taken several steps as far as informing our um, building principals and our school counselors, sharing information with them. Um, we still have some work to do in this area. Um, we did hire two new career coaches um, over the summer to help with this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about their work in just a minute. But this was a very important objective when we did the strategic plan mm -hmm. process. If you remember, this was probably the um, objective that most people spoke to when we went through the stakeholders. So we really think it's important to continue to look at what barriers we may have with this and work with our building principals and our school counselors to kind of work through those and identify ways we can really promote this and provide incentives for our students. Are you able to identify any early barriers now that that would be a... Well, this is... Probably one of the biggest is it's not a graduation requirement. Yeah. So if it was a crime, if it was a requirement, we would get to 100 percent pretty easy, <laughs> right? I mean that that's the one, the obvious one. That's but we do have some thoughts and ideas, and I know that Dr. Kev, you're going to get to those. Yeah, in a minute. that you are you hit it right on the nail, right on the head. There, it is not a requirement, so it's a lofty goal. It's an important, very important objective, but we really got to get creative on how we promote this with our students. So one of the ways is the career coaches and you funded this so that we could hire two new career coaches and they have really been busy since um, August. They work closely with our school counselors and our classroom teachers to help students explore different career pathways. Um, they go into the classrooms and present, they organize activities. We've done a lot of mock interviews this year, lunch and learns, had guest speakers come in, um, guest panels. Um, you see some of the pictures there highlighting some of the things they've done and they've really worked to collaborate and reach out with to business partners that might be interested in providing these internships and mentorships. Um, another thing is we started the new credit for work course which students can get credit for their work after school jobs and summer jobs. They're working very closely with the students to promote this. And you're familiar with the Engaged NYCSD database. I shared this um, with you last year. Um, we are growing in numbers with our participants in the database. These are our business partners who want to work with us um, it, it, with the internships and mentorships, but also the other career awareness pieces such as guest speaking and the mock interviews and such. Um, we, um, on the picture on the top there, that is a cybersecurity panel that came into York High last week, or may, may have been the week before. Business um, professionals with um, cybersecurity, government, military, and they presented to our students. So hoping, you know, we're hoping that as we pique the interest with our students through these experiences, with these partnerships that we have, we're going to see more interest in some work work-related experiences. Um, the information for Engaged NYCSD and the link to sign up is on our York County School Division website. So we um, are encouraging the audience to hop onto the website, um, get involved with this, and share it with others as well. 
Another thing, um, the Engaged in Database and the Trade Winds videos both came out of our Superintendent's Business Advisory Council last year. The Trade Winds videos is a partnership between the um, York County Economic Development Group and and some of us um, at Central Office to develop a series of videos that focus on authentic careers in the area that um, not only help kids to um, know more about the careers, but what they have to do to follow that path. And these are being presented to our 10th grade um, students in their English classes. We started with the introduction <coughs> last November, I mean, this past November, and we're gonna show one each month um, this school year to get them involved. So what are our next steps? Well, we have to continue to add the maker spaces in the remainder of the schools. There has been so much excitement, though. We have two of our schools that are year three and year four, uh, year two and year three schools for this. They've already gone ahead and put their maker spaces in their buildings because these are just great opportunities for learning for our students. Um, the middle school career videos will be created by the York um, Economic Development Group along with us. Therefore, um, they're gonna, their focus is a little bit different. Instead of focusing on a career like um, construction or health and medical services, they're going to focus more on the student's interests. So if a student likes to work outside, we're going to show them a, a range of careers they might choose to go into. So it's a little bit of a different focus, but it's for our middle school students. Last year, we held career fairs at all four of our high schools. We'll do the same this year in February and March, and we'll learn from our experiences last year to even promote those career fairs even more. And then I'm really excited to share our new Career Connections website. This is a website we're hoping to launch in um, January, and as you can see, it follows kind of what I've shared with you tonight, the elementary level, the middle school level, and the high school level. And um, this will include resources and information for students, parents, and our schools to help our students get connected to careers. So I am very thankful for the important and necessary work our teachers and leaders are doing in this area. And I want to thank you for your support as well, um, because this is very meaningful um, work for our students. So thank you so much. And um, that is my presentation. I'm happy to receive, receive any comments and answer your questions at this time. That's a great presentation. It was sure. indeed. Yeah. Fortunate to be a part of your <coughs> school division. A lot of opportunities for yes. the kids. That's wonderful. The six elementary schools that are in maker spaces now, when will the other four come on board or is that a school uh, decision, principal decision? Mm -hmm. So the the rollout with the grant was based on the number of military connected students as well as science SOL scores. So year two schools, we're already working with them with um, planning for next year and that's Coventry and Tabell, but Tabell has actually already launched theirs. They're the ones, one of the schools that jumped ahead and we'll have Grafton Middle School on board next year. Year three, we have Magruder, um, York Elementary and Queens Lake Middle and then uh, year four, we have Dare and Seaford, although Dare has already jumped in and started their makerspace okay. as well. And what we're seeing is some of these schools are coming on board before we get to the the, um, the <coughs> grant resources to them because of where they roll out in the process. Um, however, we've reached out to Dodia to see if maybe we can support them a little bit earlier if, if they are interested. Okay. So. Thank you. Any more questions? Dr. Okay. Right. Thank Great. You, Dr. Okay. Dr. Shandor, I believe we have one more item. I'm going to let you talk about that. We do. We have one more presentation, and as we do every year, we're going to present the program of studies. It's middle and high school course information registration guide. And here to do that is our Director of Secondary <coughs> Instruction, Ms. Angie Siders. Can you hit the escape button? Okay. Can you go try to get a scan? Thank you. Can you go to the... Go on the zone. I can't see that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. 
Good evening, members of the boards and Dr. Shandor. This evening, I'm delighted to provide you an update on our program of studies. We'll be talking about our additions, our revisions, and our proposed deletions for the FY 2021 school year. Before I begin, I would like to provide a little background for you and our viewing public. The Program of Studies Handbook is an informational and registration guide for our middle and high school courses. The handbook is reviewed, revised, and published annually. We also make updates to our website. It's a collaborative process, so in around April and the spring, teachers can submit classes they would like, and we have a committee that reviews and works on this um, in the fall, and so I'm delighted to prepare and show you these changes this evening. There are four new YCSD courses being proposed for the 21 school year. The first two directly align with the strategic plan. First, make it your business is for students in grades 7 to 8, so our middle school students. Um, as you're aware, entrepreneurship is beginning of one of the first career choices for our students in the future. So this class is going to allow them to learn and explore entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship concepts, um, business, and marketing plans. The second course, AP Computer Science Principles at the high school level, this course is designed to attract a greater diversity of students to the field, focusing on creative problem solving, real world applications to better prepare students to be college and career ready, as Dr. Cagle just shared earlier. We are working with NIMSI on costs to expand the training. But lastly, I want to draw your attention to the cost and budget impact columns. You will notice that both courses have $1,000 listed for curriculum writing under the cost column, but $0 for the budget impact. This is because we have an existing budget for curriculum writing, and so no additional funds are being requested to implement these courses. You will see these repeated throughout the presentation. We will only add a dollar amount under the budget impact if additional funds are needed to offer the course. We're also proposing an addition to Sports Medicine 2. This course is currently being piloted at the Governor's Health Sciences Academy at Bruton High School. We just need to formalize the course offering in the Program of Studies. Sports Medicine 2 provides a sequential elective for our students. The cost for textbooks would be $840 and the curriculum is $1,000. Lastly, we're recommending Dance Arts 4 practicum at SOA to align with the practicum opportunity with other SOA course offerings. Like all other practicums, it requires 140 after school hours and a full year project, which may include a mentorship, a research project, or a formal end of the year presentation. At this time, I would like to take a few moments to update you on the proposed revisions of the Program of Studies. As you look at the next few slides, you will notice they are organized in a similar fashion. I want to draw your attention to the third column, as the column tells you specifically what change is being recommended, the course title, course description, or pre -rec. For drama productions, the course description has been updated. Language was added to let students know that intro to drama is preferred prior to enrolling in drama productions. However, the committee did not make it a required prereq because they wanted a flexibility to allow students to take drama if they wanted drama. With 3D design, course changes we made to the prereq as a language written was a little confusing, so we wanted to make sure we clarified that. Previously, it read that the students had to take Art 1 and Crafts or Ceramics, making students think they had to take two classes before enrolling in the um, 3D class, so now they know that they only really need to take one. And then, the Career Internship. The change to the title was formerly Cooperative Education. We also removed the COREC. Um, the updated course allows YCSD students to partner with any business not just your county school division. So we're excited about that change. 
The next revision is student technology internship, where we have made slight changes to the course title and the description. These changes align to our strategic plan and the changes to the course description provide students with a better understanding of intended outcomes of the course. So they're gonna do real troubleshooting, they're gonna be able to um, work with different technology devices, um, they're gonna be able to work with software and have those different experiences. So more in the field. <coughs> The next four proposed revisions are related to the IB program at York High School. For IB Mathematics SL, the course description will be revised to align with the updated IB curriculum. And then as you can see, IB Physics HL11 and IB Physics HL12 will be added. The course titles change from IB Physics SL11 and SL12, and this alignment is to help the IB course offerings and align with the IB curriculum. Lastly, the IB math application, the course title will be revised along with the course description to align with the updated IB curriculum as well. Both revisions on this slide are for courses offered at the School of the Arts at Bruton High School. So as you can see, AP English 11 Language and Composition, that um, originally was for SOA Advanced English. English 11 was the course title and then AP English 12 Literature and Composition um, is, was SOA Advanced English 12 and the reason why we're changing that is because students are already doing the AP curriculum, the syllabus is getting approved by College Board and the students really want the AP class on their transcript. They're taking the AP exam so that's the reason for the change. For Arabic courses 1 through 3, the course description has been revised to include a note that will no longer fulfill requirements of the honors program. This is because Virtual Virginia no longer offers Arabic 4 and cannot guarantee Arabic 3 will be available in the future. So we want to make sure parents that want that honors program, they understand, you know, that's four years of a world language or the 2 and 2. They might not be able to get the four years of the Arabic. And with regard to all marketing co-op courses, the committee recommended changes to the course descriptions and credits. Co-op hours are changing from 540 to 280 to align with state guidelines, and credits will be reduced from 3 to 2. However, students can earn that third credit if they work the additional 280 hours. With the School of the Arts program description, the committee recommended the addition of language which states, students must also maintain a C average in their SOA course to remain in the SOA program. All students in SOA are currently notified of this requirement, but they felt like it should be added in the program of studies to make it clear. And I would, at this time, really like to thank the board because we are so excited that you approved the funding for this program last year through the budget process, our early college program. The dual enrollment revision is based on our new early college program and the need to add course descriptions to match in our specialty section. The dual enrollment allows our students to earn six credits in the fall and a minimum of 12 credits in the spring from Thomas Nelson Community College. Participants may earn up to 21 semester hours of transferable credits prior to high school graduation. The courses offered in this program are part of the Commonwealth College Course Collaborative. The committee also record, record, excuse me, recommended three course deletions. deletions. All marketing OE courses will be eliminated to align with state guidelines. Probability and statistics with discrete is a year-long course that was created by the 4x4, and that is no longer needed. However, we will still <coughs> offer semester classes in our schools. And leadership technology education, education was recommended for deletion um, due to low enrollment for this course. And now we have some other courses that I talked to you about earlier that will give a more real world experience for our students. Lastly, I would like to draw your attention to our New Horizons proposed course changes. Pharmacy Tech will no longer be offered to juniors. Students must take 
have to take their national exam within 30 days of graduation. So that is why New Horizons is proposing to change that course. The second proposed change is for plumbing and pipe fitting. And right now, um, we have it in the AM session and we're working towards adding it in. They're working for the PM session because they want to open it up to more students and they have a lot of student interest. So that will expand their program. And last but not least, the course title, code and course description is being revised for our vet tech. Um, to align better with what is being taught in class and it eliminates redundancy. So they're going to have a Vet Tech 1 and Vet, Net, vet Tech 2 and they're going to delete the animal care. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the work of our Program of Studies Committee. These changes will come up for your approval at the December 16th board meeting and this concludes the presentation and I welcome any questions or comments you may have. One thing that uh, I said, and we talked about it in our meeting last week, just I'd be curious over time to see the implementation of more dual enrollment if that reduces the number of AP classes that students take. Because I know on the STRAP plan, higher enrollment in the AP where students can choose one or the other. If they might choose that one where it's they pass the class, they get the college credit versus get an A in the class but not get a high enough score on the AP test, not get the credit. I'm just wondering if students are going to be just having to decide between the two. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I'll check on that and see. I don't, I haven't found that yet, but I'll look into it. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be as the program gets rolling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> just a, a comment, a couple questions for comment. Just the, uh, the career, uh, excuse me, entrepreneurship. That's really cool. Yeah. I can see a bunch of these little kids well, walking around with their coat and tie and their glasses and their briefcases, you know, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> especially when you're starting younger in elementary school, the maker spaces and the STEM and yeah. all that, you will have that. That's really exciting. Yeah. I think yeah. that's, that's, that's spot on. Um, the uh, revision to career internship, can you explain that to me one more time? I missed exactly what the change was on that um, under proposed course provisions. I think that's the one, oh, proposed, I think that is the one where right now it currently um, is only the students can only do the internship in York County School Division, and so now they're going to be able to branch out to businesses outside of the school division. Do this is slide five. And it was called cooperative and uh, co-op before. The course and, title changed. And so yeah. the ch title changed because it kind of got confused with the marking co-op and, and those classes okay. as well. So the title was changed, but then also to, to expand it a little bit to more opportunities to for internships. Uh -huh. okay. That have partnerships outside the right. school. And then one last question, really, is the early college program, that's at Thomas Nelson, I assume? Yes. Is that going to be both campuses, or is it just one campus? Yes, they could go to either both campus. Yes, yeah, so that way, like, if you know they're in Bruton Zone, right. they can go to the Thomas Nelson up okay. in Williamsburg, or they can still go to the Hampton one. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Great you. job. Thanks. I'd just like to thank all of everybody that presented this evening. We always appreciate you keeping us updated on a regular basis. Barbara, this is our last work session. Yes, it is. Hoorah! <laughs> <We're ready>. oh. <laughs> but uh, anyway, all right, well, our regular board meeting will be this coming Monday, December 16th, here at your call. A little change in the schedule due to the... Uh, Christmas holiday. So uh, anyway, we are in need of a closed session to discuss personal matters. Could a board member please take us into closed session? Sure. Uh, I move that the York County School Board convene in a closed session to consult with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to the exemption of Section 2.2-3711A8 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Second. A motion was made by Mr. Higginbotham and seconded by Mrs. Haywood for the school board to convene in closed session. Mr. Higginbotham? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. Thank you. We are now in closed session. Enjoy your evening and your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.